So how was uh, last night? Because you were doing this event with uh, Marie Kolbe. It was such a nice night. And then we went out afterwards. I went for dinner with my mother-in-law and we just went into a bar and half the audience were in there. So then we sat and ate. <laughs> I, I mean, I was certainly self-conscious. I was eating like meat and cheese yeah. in front of everyone. <laughs> But, you know, that's legitimate. You know, it's fine. Is it like yeah, when you're on tour and readers meet you, they want to discuss like the things they read in the book, like uh, how you have helped them and you have to constantly like talking about food and... Well, I don't, I quite like that. Uh, there's, you remember Oasis? There was, uh, yeah. no, Noel, uh, Noel Gallagher had this view that like his job as a pop star, as a rock star, was when fans approach him and want to ask about his life or when he gets pap, that's your job. That's what you signed up to. So I feel like mm. if I wrote a book about food, my job is then if strangers want to talk to me about their diet, well, that's, that's awesome. That's, you know. It's kind of a contract the uh I put myself out there, I expose myself, you give me attention and- uh, You're you completely right, it's yeah. a social contract. So yeah. I feel like you gotta, I mean, obviously I'm not Noel Gallagher. I, I think there not would yet. come a moment where you're like, okay, I'm <laughs> I'm done with this. But no, it's like, it's very, ni- it's very nice. And, and people are in Norway, <coughs> forgive me, people are so engaged with this subject, you know, they know, mm. they know what, they have really detailed questions. Yeah. But uh, we're going to talk a lot about ultra processed food today. And is there any cultural differences or uh, are uh, the UK uh, f- further along down the road with, uh, with the debate, with the food debate than in Norway? Our diet is way worse. So you are further down the road in terms of, I think, the population accepting something needs to be done. You have a traditional diet that you need to preserve. There is health that needs to be protected and vulnerability. In the UK, we have no traditional diet left. Our di- our culture, our food culture is ultra processed. The standard of national debate though, there's a huge debate. So, but the debate takes the form of the public believing there is a controversy. And there isn't really, I would suggest among academic experts, there is no real controversy. Hmm. There are details we might disagree on But in the UK, there is a controversy because industry are very, very skillfully manipulating the argument. Uh, you wrote a book, uh, Ultra Processed People. Actually, the Norwegian title is only ultra processed. So what happened to the people in Norway, I guess? Oh, that's so yeah. interesting. Did I thought that? it was, well, I looked at the Norway, I wondered if people was all wrapped <laughs> up in there. But the subtitle is the same, I get ultra processed. So they've just left off either food or people. I guess the implication is the same. Everything is ultra processed. And maybe that's like one thing, writing the book, I realized the book is not just about food. The reason it's called ultra processed people is because our lives are increasingly ultra processed. Our tech is ultra processed. Our vehicles are, our Mm. apps. So much of our lives is, is about creating addictive products that take our money and modify our health. Now, why does, ultra processed food matter to society. You said a little bit about it now, but also why did it matter to you to write a book about it? So I had, I guess, three motivations. Along, I'm an infectious diseases doctor, so I studied tropical medicine. And my academic work is as a molecular virologist. So as a young doctor, I worked in very low income countries, Central African Republic mainly. So one of the, I mean, the poorest country in the world and saw lots of children who died of diarrheal disease. And the reason they died was infection, but the reason they got the infection was because they were being marketed uh, baby food that their parents could not make up with clean water, their parents could not afford, Mm. their parents could not read the instructions to make it up correctly. Um, So I, my research shifted from studying bacteria and viruses to studying how big companies affect human health. So the the biggest thing that affects all of our health is the actions of very large industrial sectors, tobacco, alcohol, food, Mm. oil, uh, motor transport. These are the determinants of how long we live, particularly in the global north, but but increasingly in in poor countries too. But uh, it also mattered for you uh, on a personal level, right? Right, so I, I guess, I guess, but so I have this identical twin brother, who's my clone, we're genetically the same. Mm-hmm. 
He moved to America to do a, a, a master's degree there and he put on a huge amount of weight. He became 30 kilos heavier than me. And so for a decade, I, I shamed him. I was very embarrassed by him. And I felt like he was, we, we work together, we, we do television together. And I felt really uh, that he was in my body representing me badly. And I want to be clear, I think that it, I'm very embarrassed now by having had that thought. So I pressured him to lose weight for a very long time. And it was when I finally stopped nagging him, that's when he did something. And so a lot of the book is really about how we should treat people who live with, who struggle with this food. And and that's me too. So I, I struggle with this food, but I didn't move to America. He had some stress in his life that I didn't have. So we're all very vulnerable to this stuff as an addictive substance. And I think I, I personally have been addicted to it for a really long time. And, and we know that 10 to 20% of people are. So the big discovery with your brother was uh, the motivation have to come from inside. Right. So, I mean, this is like psychology 101. Yeah. If, but it's, it's such a profound thing to discover for a doctor because what doctors love to do is give people more or less unsolicited advice. My patients come in, I say, you know, stop smoking, eat well, mm. uh, take these pills. It's very hard. What I don't do is try and understand why are they smoking? Why are they drinking? What's their housing like? How are they stuck? And most of us are confined by our circumstances, by our environment. So advice is always terrible. So if, if people get only one thing from reading the book, it would be watch your own plate, mind your business. Don't, don't nag other people because we know if we nag people who live with excess weight, it will drive them to gain more weight. The same thing about workouts. Uh, right. You could do the advice, people like, uh, try this, try that. And if they're not motivated inside, they probably do it for a couple of weeks and they just... It's the same for everything. And I see it with my kids. I can nag and push my kids toward things, but if I, if I let them discover it on their own, then yeah. they own whatever it is. And if I don't nag my daughter to do her piano practice, eventually she sits down at the piano and she, she does want to be good at the piano. Mm. The more I nag her, the more we, you know, it's terrible for both of us. So a large part of the food debate in Norway focus on the personal responsibility. Is it all about willpower and self-respect to do something with your diet? Or are we, probably all of us, somehow trapped in a food system that makes it extremely hard and expensive to live a healthy life? There are three myths I try and bust <clears throat> about weight in the book. And the most important one is that your weight has to do with your willpower. The arguments around willpower are, are, are dead, they are buried, they have no scientific merit, no moral merit, and no economic merit. So there are, I mean, we could spend the next two hours talking just about this. We're, it's, it's, um, if we look at the graphs of when everyone started to gain weight in America, in 1975, all ages, Men and women, black, white, and Hispanic, everyone starts to gain weight at the same time. Hmm. Now, you cannot persuade me that elderly Hispanic women, middle-aged black men and young white women all lost moral responsibility at the same moment. What happened was the uh, mass introduction of industrially processed foods into the diet and that grew and grew and grew and weight went up and up and up. You might, anyone listening... The sad thing is many people who live with excess weight have the experience that it is their fault, that they are choosing this food, that they they could not go into the fast food shop. They mm. could not eat the donut. In, in fact, I would suggest if you're someone who's food, food motivated like me, you have genes that predispose you toward different food behavior, and you have about as much control over not eating junk food that's in front of you as an alcoholic does about not drinking a drink, someone who's addicted to drugs of abuse or a, or a cigarette smoker. You know, if someone's a smoker and someone else is smoking in the room, they will start smoking too. So th these are, these are addictive foods designed to make you purchase them and to make you eat as much as possible. So, so willpower is not, it, there's no evidence for it, but most importantly, when we, design policy using willpower, it doesn't work. So we've done this in the UK where we we have very bad advice and basically just say to people, you know, try and eat good food and do more exercise. And we have 30 years of data showing it does not work. Mm. Whereas when you change the food environment, we know it does work. 
Same with smoking. So the way you see it, obesity is a question of the food system and addiction rather than identity and uh, people also throw in uh, laziness in there. Laziness has nothing to do with it. So, so many of my patients who live with excess weight, you know, I have patients who've lost my entire body weight twice. So they go up to 200 kilos, they mm. lose 100 kilos, they go back up to 200 kilos, and they lose another 100 kilos. Now, the 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 will it takes to lose 100 kilos is is astounding. I couldn't do it. I doubt you could do it. Most people can't. They do it, but the food environment forces them back. So it's it's very simple. It's a collision of genetic vulnerability with the constant marketing of this of this food. Is it all addiction? I think people listening to this, there are two types of people, basically. There are people who just casually eat too much bad food because, because the bad food is sold to us as healthy. It's all our bread. It's our breakfast cereal. It's all our nutrition bars and health yep. products. It's, it's our ready meals. It's everything. And once those people have knowledge, they can actually quite easily cut down. So like lots of us drink, I don't know, a few years ago, I was drinking uh, a couple of beers every night. I don't have a problem with alcohol. As I learn that, you know, you get older and you start learning more about alcohol, you, I now drink beer on my Friday nights. Some people can do that. But then there are people who have a, an addicted relationship. And that that's a smaller group. That isn't everyone who lives with excess weight or obesity. But those people are gonna gonna struggle more. It's it's vexed because in the UK at least, people who are addicted to this food, many of them cannot quit because it's the only food they can afford. You know, ultra processed food, its success is it is at the point of purchase incredibly cheap for people. Mm. And kids always eat it because it tastes it's good. Designed. It, yeah. Well, it doesn't taste good necessarily. I I always, people say that we have actually quite good evidence. It's not tasty. Mm. If you go and buy a, a takeaway burger and fries and you put it on a plate with a knife and fork and you try and eat it like a normal meal mm -hmm. and you ask yourself, does this taste good? You'll find it doesn't, but it's still desirable. It, it's somewhat like cigarettes. You know, if you smoke a cigarette, does it really taste good or are you just addicted to it? Yeah. So the, the, but the evidence that the food is for some people addictive is, is very, very strong. And for those people who are addicted, they are as addicted as smokers are or alcoholics or people who use drugs of abuse. Desirable is a much better word than good, yeah. One, perhaps the discovery I made writing the book that most interests me and which is the focus now of a lot of my work is the idea that wanting things and liking things are completely different subjects. We can like things we don't want and we can want things we don't like. And there are lots of, we see it with people. We often want people we, we don't particularly like. Um, and we might like people, like people we don't particularly desire. The same is true of food, drugs, lots of things. I don't like my phone, but I want my phone. <laughs> sure. Um, how is it possible that this one dietary factor can drive so many disease mechanisms? You've labeled and listed some of them now. And if so, how is it possible? It's pretty simple. I mean, w what I am proposing and what Marit Colby is proposing, what lots of people are proposing is, is this very simple idea. If you build your body and you fuel your body using synthetic molecules that don't occur in nature, mixed together in ways that you have never encountered in your evolutionary history, you will get sick in a lot of different ways. So, we, we are very sure that this food does cause health problems. It causes weight gain and obesity, depression, anxiety, inflammation throughout the body, but especially in the bowels, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, cardiovascular disease, strokes, heart attacks, metabolic disease like type two diabetes, and early death from all causes. So it's causing a lot of different health problems. How it does it, we can talk for several hours about the evidence that so we've got that epidemiology data that shows the association, but we have laboratory evidence about how it does it. So if we look at the, if we look at say the, uh, the inflammation, well, a lot of the food has, for example, emulsifiers or non-nutritive sweeteners, artificial sweeteners in it. Um, those are two of the most common additives. The additives aren't the main problem, but those are two of the most common. We know they change the friendly bacteria in the gut. They make the gut leak. Um, if you leak 
fecal bacteria into your bloodstream. It causes inflammation, liver damage. And there's good evidence that that uh, leads to the kind of changes we associate with bowel cancer and bowel inflammation. So that's like one very simple way. And we have very good data from very good experiments in rats and people linking those additives with those problems. Mm. Uh, back to the food in industry. Is it fair to say that the food industry, to put it very simple here, um, are focusing on three aspects, uh, making the products uh, with the cheapest possible ingredients, with a long shelf life and max profits? Yes, the food industry is focused on one thing actually, which is money. And we can demonstrate using their own data. So my last paper was published with economists mm. and we just used food industry financial data to show that all they care about is money. This again is not a revolutionary hypothesis. Anyone who works in a publicly limited company where you can buy a share, that is the function of that company. It's, it's the legal obligation of that company to make money for its owners. It can't damage its own share price. So the way food companies make money is by prolonging shelf life because you can then make a mince pie for next Christmas in February, which helps you with your production lines. Um, use the cheapest possible ingredients. Why would you use an egg if you can use a synthetic emulsifier? Why would you use butter when you can use palm stearin? You know, so you hammer down the price of ingredients and then you make the food addictive. And you have to make every month, or every quarter of every year when you hand in your financial reports, you have to have sold more food than you did last quarter because the companies are owned mainly by institutional investors, by hedge funds and by big investment funds. And particularly the, the hedge funds, they need quarterly growth. Some, some are fo focused on annual growth, but no one cares much about growth in a longer cycle than two or three years. So you have to be eating more and more and more every three years. And in, in the UK, we're maxed out. We can't eat any more at meals. So we've now, the companies have filled the after breakfast slot with a breakfasty bar. Then there's a snack when you get to work. There's mm. a pre-lunch snack. There's a 3 p.m. snack. There's stuff for the middle of the night. Breakfast cereals are now marketed as being suitable for dessert. Desserts are mar marketed as being suitable for 24 hours a day. So they they need us to be continuously eating. And the most exciting thing for the food companies is to expand into South Asia, into Africa, and yeah. into East Asia. That that's that's the only way they can get growth. And so they're doing it incredibly aggressively. Is it like uh Do you get a lot uh, a counter argument that this that we talked about now is sounds like a neo Marxist or anti free market argument? Well, I, th th my book is not anti capitalist. I'm not anti capitalist. So, if we look at that incentive structure, the companies are obliged to their owners. So, who owns them? Well, these big investment funds like BlackRock, like Vanguard. But who owns BlackRock and Vanguard? Well, my private pension is in BlackRock and Vanguard. So, when I retire. I need more money than I put into the pension. I, I need growth. Mm. So I am the problem. So you can critique capitalism if you want, but you might as well critique gravity. There's no there's no point. It's it's the water we swim in, it's the air we breathe. It's you're not going to bring down capitalism. What you can argue for and what I argue for is some very gentle regulation. Now, whenever we regulate big industries, we generally see improved performance. The pharmaceutical industry, I mean, look, you know, Look at the last few years, the vaccines, the new LG, uh, GLP-1 agonists, semaglutide, Wagovi, Azempic. Um, pharma is the most stringently regulated, along with aviation of all industries. It does incredibly well. We've seen the more regulation, the better the growth, especially compared to when it was unregulated. Mm. So um, industry can withstand regulation. And free market, I am proposing a free market, right? So free markets function on perfect information. That's one of the principles of a free market. At the moment, we have information asymmetry where the food industry hides information, they suppress research, they create bias in data. What I'm asking for is proper, independent oversight, regulation and information for consumers. Consumers can then boycott companies. Boycotts are principles of a free market. So I am I am a free marketeer. I want um, a diversity of interests. What what we have at the moment is an oligopoly of a very small number of companies with enormous power, creating a very very managed market of subsidies and uh, regulations that suit them. So I am I am pro capitalism. I'm pro growth. 
I would like to see a booming industry of real food, of small producers, of, you know, in Norway, you have a big farming community. There's so much growth that is being suppressed by a handful of transnational companies. So if you are a Norwegian nationalist and you're right wing and you want a strong military and uh, a good national football team and a booming economy to beat other countries, the best thing you can do is to regulate the transnational food corporations and feed your children well. So my argument should be apolitical and appeal across the spectrum. When you talk, um, about are you persuaded? Like I, I feel so strongly that I will not be painted as a neo-Marxist. I'm, I'm not a Marxist. When you talk about this in the UK, um, are the industry going after you? Are they trying to um, destroy your reputation? Well, or? it's very clever. So they're doing two things. So the first thing is, yes, they are. So, um, but I thought when I wrote the book, you know, and we a lot of lawyers read the book before it was published. But I thought, well, I'll, I'll have a row with Nestle, with Coke, with McDonald's, with the big supermarkets. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll get my day in court. And I was prepared for that because I think I can go toe to toe with them on the evidence. You don't get that. What you have is an argument with someone who sounds extremely credible, a professor at a decent university. Yeah. And what you have to do is work out how the food industry is paying them. And all of those people that are arguing with me are funded by, I mean, there's, there's an academic at, Reading, the Department of Human Nutrition at Reading is funded by Pepsi and Mars. He attacks me every day on Twitter, wow. you know. And so you're constantly going, you are paid by Pepsi and Mars. Um, there are academics at Leeds who are, who are on the boards of charities funded by Coke and McDonald's. So the exhausting thing is online and in interviews, trying to have good faith academic arguments with people who are actually quite cynical. I also don't like making arguments personal. I, if you want to argue science, I, I think it's ugly to have to point out that the person you're arguing against has a personal connection to Coca-Cola, for example. Mm. But that's the position you're put in. So it's, it's a very clever technique. So they're doing that. And I, I, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll say here, I do not and will never take money from any food company. Uh, I have no financial relationships with them at all. Uh, so, but the food industry are working very hard, even as they pay people to damage my reputation, they court me. So they send me weekly invitations to come and speak to them for very large amounts of money. So uh, 20,000 pounds. So what, what, what would that be like? Two, 200,000 yeah. kroner uh, for an hour's Zoom talk. Um, That's and crazy. the reason they do it when you look at the contracts, they send me the contract for this, and I can I will publish this contract at some point because I got one of them, <laughs> is it says you will never say anything ever that damages the reputation of this food company, its products, or its customers mm. throughout the universe in perpetuity. You know, that's the line. In, so even if you move to Pluto, you can't criticize them. So what they're trying to do is buy, buy your silence. Yeah, they're trying, they, they hope you're you striving with money or something like that and you, yeah. you just take the bait. It, I mean, it's very hard to turn down these amounts of money. You yeah. know? Now I'm, and I'm very fortunate because uh, I make money as a doctor and as a broadcaster and, and the, the book sells, you know, so I'm not wealthy, but I, I live very comfortably. And so it's easy for me to say no to all this. And actually I make money from saying no, if you like, by being, if I took money, Murray, Colby would never speak to me. That would, that would <laughs> sure. be the end of our relationship. It'd be the end of all my academic work. Yeah. It would be the end of book sales, you know. For young people, for my colleagues, my, you know, my PhD students, for example, it's very hard. They're, they don't have a lot of money and they are offered, you know, for them, if they get paid a thousand pounds for an afternoon of consultancy. So the food companies often try and partner with very young academics. Just say, oh, come in, do a presentation. We'll give you two, three thousand pounds, you know life-changing amounts of money if you're doing a PhD. I think it was Nassim Taleb that said, uh, ethic has to dictate your work and your work can't dictate your ethics. Oh, I love that. I should read more of him. I read yeah. some of him ages ago. I, I, you know, I have, the bad people are not the people who work at the corporation. So I met someone last night, I gave a talk with Marit mm -hmm. in the library in Oslo and 
someone afterwards came up to me. They work for a big supermarket and they said, oh, I'm one of the bad guys. And they're, <laughs> they're not. They're not. We all have bills. Mm. If you make food, you have no conflict of interest. You're just trying to sell food to people within the law. The people who are the bad guys in this story are the people with choice. The politicians and the doctors particularly who partner with the food industry because they are conflicted. When you become a doctor, you sign a piece of paper saying my my interest is my patients. Mm. It's not about making money. That's the deal. And so when and doctors are well paid. I mean, come on, you know, we we we're not all millionaires, but we we are we are handsomely paid. And so it's the doctors who partner with industry that I think are the real villains. And that they are now many, many of the social media doctors, the the doctors that people know about who have big podcasts, they have now strong relationships with companies that make UPF. Yeah. And and they are the problem. That's hard to turn around when you so deep in it. I guess. Yeah. I mean so I am now in a sort of process of working out how to have this fight. And there there is a, a there is a battle now where there is power on both sides, mm. where there is power of, of the industry and there is a there is a small group of us, people like me and Maris and our collaborators, who don't take any money. But the power we have is I think that we are telling the truth. So we have the power that the the scientists who talked about tobacco sixty years ago, we have that kind of power. We have the power of of right. Um but I think how we have this discussion is is I'm trying to figure this out. Do we attack people personally who take the money? I think we have to attack those doctors because they without those doctors, the food industry cannot do its work. They you know, no one believes the chairman of a big food company if they come on if you if you organized a debate between me and someone senior in the food industry, you know, no one's gonna believe them. If it's me and someone who's paid by them who's a professor of nutrition at a big university in Norway, yeah. well then then it's much harder. Yeah. Do you feel the audience are getting better to separate, let's say, free thinkers uh, versus people directly or indirectly paid by the industry? I sort of I want to believe people are, but the problem is it's very hard to figure out who is. So, if, for example, in the conversation, there's a there's a magazine called The Conversation. Uh, it's quite popular globally. It's often written by academics. Mm. There have been some pieces saying the harms of ultra processed food, and for balance, there have been two pieces going. You know what? Ultra processed food. It's all hype. Those authors declare no conflicts of interest. They appear to be credible academics um, at good universities. Both of them have deep relationships with Unilever, Mars, Pepsi some of these big companies, you know, mm. they, they both have separate relationships. Um, but as a casual reader of the article, it appears to be just written by a scientist who's fine. So I, I think, I think the difficulty is, um, there is a mass misunderstanding about the function of corporations that, and this is not, I have to be careful not to sound like a conspiracist here. People who work for big companies understand that the purpose is to make money. There is a kind of delusion that there are good food companies and bad food companies. In fact, they all behave in almost exactly the same way, which yeah. is to maximize dividends and equity growth for their owners. Yeah, and then they do some sponsorship and marketing to brand themselves as right the good company. Right, make the make the most addictive food you can with the cheapest ingredients, and if you can possibly put on the packet that it's healthy, that's what you should do. And so we have this massive range of harmful products with health claims. I, I would say it is almost a, a, an ironclad rule if there is a health claim on a packet, mm. low in salt, supports your family's health, low fat, low sugar, high fiber, high protein, all of that will be ultra processed and it is likely to be harmful. If there's any health claims on the package, uh, you should uh, you should not buy that thing, or you just be aware that this is. Uh, for you said something brilliant in another podcast that uh, raw food is never labeled or uh, with health. Uh, what are the foods we know are healthy? Okay, so we you don't have to believe me about the evidence on ultra processed food for us to all agree on the overwhelming evidence that traditional diets with whole and minimally processed foods are extremely healthy. Everyone agrees on that. You know, diets with walnuts, pulses, olive oil, fish, vegetables, fruit, you know, fruit, veg, whole grains. Everyone agrees on this. No one's disputing it, okay? When you buy broccoli or apples or a bag of oats, 
There's no health claim on it. Now, the reason there is no health claim on it is because there's no money to be made from it. Mm. So the big food companies, Danone, Nestle, Coca-Cola, um, Yum, they do not sell any whole food or hardly any. The reason for that is you can't have intellectual property with broccoli or milk or steak. These are commodities. So if you're a food company and I'm a food company, if I go, well, I'm going to beat you by selling broccoli, we just go, we'll sell broccoli too. And the consumer doesn't care. The best broccoli in the world is pretty much the same as the cheapest, worst broccoli in the world, so long as they're both fresh. Meat is meat. And we think that we care about grass-fed, organic Wagyu beef versus, you know, cheap farm lot beef. But in fact, they taste the same. People can't tell the difference. Mm. And in the shopping basket, they're the same. So the only way you can make money as a corporation is to have intellectual property, like a Kit Kat, Pepsi Max, Coca-Cola. No one else can make Coca-Cola. No one else can make a Kit Kat. And so that's how you, you seek rent on your intellectual property. And that's why all the products are branded. You have uh, a similar system in Norway to the yeah. one we have in the UK, where there's a red, an orange, and a green yeah. for salt, fat, and sugar, basically. And um, Coca-Cola, for example, were one of the first companies to voluntarily put the traffic lights on their products because sugar Coca-Cola has one red and three greens because it's got no fat, it's got relatively low calories compared to volume, and, um, and it's got no salt. So if you look at a can of Coke in the UK, it is basically a health drink. It has three green health signals mm. and you don't notice the red because it's already on a red can. Now, Diet Coke in the UK or any Diet Cola has four green traffic lights. But if you look at the ingredients on a can of Diet Drink, Pepsi, Coke, doesn't matter, they're all the same. Yeah. The ingredients are uh, colour, phosphoric acid, citric acid, artificial sweeteners, aspartame and acid sulfame K, and, and water. And there is, aside from the water, all of those ingredients are basically harmful. So, you know, the acids dissolve your teeth, the phosphoric acid, it may dissolve your skeleton, so you pee out your bones. This is, this is I think, quite a persuasive theory. And the non-nutritive sweeteners, acesulfame K and aspartame. Aspartame has been linked to cancer by the World Health Organization, and both of them affect your microbiome and your metabolic health. So. The companies are very happy with this current labeling system that allows them to sell foods as being both healthy and unhealthy. So if you go and look at the worst foods in the supermarket, usually they can have, most of them figured out a way of having one green light. So what, as a consumer, is it a health, it's like healthy and unhealthy at the same time? At a traffic light that was shining green and red, what would you do? Do you yeah. drive? Do you stop? It's not... It's entirely unclear. It doesn't make any sense. And we know we've got loads of research that shows that consumers are confused and they can't use the traffic lights and they don't use the traffic lights. Mm. We have really good research that shows if you put a big black stop sign on food for salt, fat, sugar, calories, trans fats uh, and sweeteners, that the public really pay attention. It's very clear and you don't have any health claims on food. There should be no... because. Even broccoli, broccoli is not an intrinsically healthy food. It is part of a healthy diet. Mm. But if you only eat broccoli, you won't live very long. So saying that any one food is healthy is, is, is absurd. You need a, a dietary pattern that doesn't have bad food in it. And the bad food is industrially processed food. So the label and branding system, uh, intentions were probably good, but the industry managed to use them to do their, their Advantage I don't think that, I, I'm going to challenge you that. I don't actually think the intentions were good because certainly in the UK, the labeling system has been very supported by charities like the British Nutrition Foundation, which is funded by all the biggest food companies, including Coca-Cola and McDonald's. Mm. So I don't think the intentions were ever good. And the idea that it would work i don't think anyone could ever have thought it would work. And there was never any investigation about whether it did work. So I, no, I think from the regulation from the very beginning has been in partnership with industry. And you, we all know you can't regulate an industry in partnership. The banks are not regulated by themselves after the 2008 crisis. Drug companies are not regulated by themselves. Mm. Obviously with food and additives, it should be the same deal. Yeah. Okay. 
let's zoom out and talk about the definition of uh, UPF. Um, what is ultra processed food? So there's a there's a long formal definition. It's eleven paragraphs long. Hardly anyone's read the whole thing, hmm. um, but it includes certain key concepts. So it it boils down to this: if something is wrapped in plastic and it contains at least one ingredient that you don't normally find in a domestic kitchen, like a synthetic emulsifier or natural flavorings or an artificial sweetener, then it is probably ultra processed. And they are all made for profit. That is part of the that's part of the definition is there's this this kind of social economic idea in there. So if you are wondering if something is is ultra processed, we, we can define it. There's great agreement on the on these foods, right? It's a way of describing an American industrial diet. So you can negotiate. There's always a blurred edge. There's no perfect way of describing food at all. There is there is no perfect categorization. But the definition works really well in real life. So you could say that most of the food made by transnational food companies is ultra processed. Anything with a health claim, anything made, any food or most foods made by food companies owned by pension funds are ultra processed mm. because it's the only way they can make money. And in fact, we know that when consumers go into a shop, if you test them on what they buy, people are really good at using the definition, you know, you get a pack of bread out, you look at the bread, if the bread's got palm fat and an emulsifier in it, well, there you go, it's UPF. Mm. But critics claim that there's no universal definition. That is a lie in the sense that um, among independent scientists, the the definition of ultra-processed food was created in 2009 by a team in Brazil as part of a thing called the NOVA classification, which divides food into four groups. Mm. NOVA 4 is ultra-processed food. They wrote this very long definition. The definition is agreed on by UNICEF, by the United Nations World Food Programme, by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, by the governments of France, Belgium, Israel, Canada, all the governments in South and Central America. And the definition of NOVA Group 4, the one I've explained, mm. is used by research groups at Cambridge, Harvard, McGill, Yale, Princeton, Oxford, uh, Imperial, my group at University College London, universities in Norway, uh, all the major academic institutions of the world. And they all agree on this one definition. The food industry don't like it. So they have created their own definitions. They say we need to use high fat salt sugar. But we now have a huge number of very good studies. So um, the big population studies, the kind that we linked tobacco to lung cancer, we have around 80 of these studies linking ultra-processed food to health harms. So that's that's a lot, right? I mean, that's a huge mm. number of studies. And they are done by good groups at these big institutions. The one on anxiety, depression was done by a group at Harvard last summer. So um, there is great agreement. The definition works very well for research and it is very widely agreed on. Now the definition, so what that science allows us to do, and I want to be really clear about what it tells us. It does not tell us that that particular bread or this particular cereal is poisonous or will do this harm to you. It tells us that a diet based on industrially processed foods is harmful. And this is so obvious. We have so many different sources of evidence about this. We know that traditional diets are healthy. We know that diets that exclude that food are health giving. We know that whole foods are good for you. So we can, we've got loads of data. Um, so all of that is very, very widely agreed on. And then we have lots of lab evidence that explains how the food does it. So the, the claim, the definition is not agreed on is it is not agreed on by the food industry in the same way that the oil industry does not agree on the evidence around climate change, but everyone else does agree on the definition. A favorite counter argument of the Nova skeptics is if you buy cookies at the store, they are UPF. If I make if you lunch, buy what? If you buy cookies. Oh, cookies. Yeah. yeah at the store. They yeah. are ultra processed food. Yeah. But if you make them at home, yeah. they're not. Yes. But they're just as unhealthy. What's your thought on that? Um, that is not true. So th th there are several reasons the cookies you make at home will be very, very different to the ones you buy in the store. Um, let's, let's, so for a start, you won't make them using the same ingredients and they will not have the same nutrient profile. When you make cookies at home, at home, you use generally less salt, 
less sugar, different fats, and you don't add all the additives. So the, the ingredient profile will be different. But let's assume you get the recipe from the food company uh, and use the same ingredients minus the additives. So the, the, you will never use emulsifiers to make your cookies at home. You will never use flavorings to make your cookies at home. And we know that those things drive uh, different tastes in the mouth and an excess consumption. But the main point, even if you use the same nutrient profile, the cookies in the store are not just put together haphazardly in the factory, right? When you design a cookie in a food company, you test that cookie and you test it on a big panel of people. And what are the things you measure? How quickly do they eat it? And how much of it do they eat? Mm. When you cook a cookie at home, even if you are the world's greatest chef, you are not designing your cookie over hundreds or thousands of different tests to make your children and family eat as much of that cookie as possible. So, you know, if when any of us eat homemade cookies, they we we might like them as much as the store bought cookies, but we will generally eat less of them. So, in so many ways, the homemade cookie doesn't have the additives, and it is not designed to drive excess consumption. It also doesn't come in a packet with an ad. It doesn't have a cartoon character. Um, it won't look as nice. It won't be coloured, and all of those things are aspects of ultra processing. And most importantly. When you cook the cookie at home, it takes you two hours. You've got to go and buy the eggs and the flour and the sugar and the chocolate chips and the, you've got to mix it all up and it takes you ages. So when you want a cookie at home, you can't have one instantaneously. The point about the whole cookie in the shop is um, you, you, you buy 20 of them and then in 10, minute, 10 minutes time, if you've eaten them, you can go and buy another 20. You go five minutes mm. down the road. Yeah. So everything about the shop cookie, from the ingredients to the nutrient profile, to the design process, to the packaging, to the flavoring, to the availability and to the cost, everything is different. It is ridiculous to say that home-baked cookies are the same. But mainly, no one, there is no question if all you eat is your own, if you're a good baker, I mean, I have friends who are, can make an incredible cookie. If all that's all you eat, you can gain weight eating homemade cookies, absolutely. No one is saying that fat, salt, sugar are irrelevant. But if you think that processing does not make a difference, you are living in another world. It is absolutely ridiculous. Main, also, sorry, just, I can keep, I mean, I can talk about this for two yeah, hours. Yeah, please. But the, 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 uh, this, it makes me so angry because people, how long have people been baking cookies in Norway? 150 years? 200 years? How long have you had flour, butter, eggs, sugar, uh, all available in a domestic kitchen? You know, for more than 100 years. What's your rate of childhood obesity been 100 years ago? All but zero. Did you have, were there any children living with type two diabetes a hundred years ago? No. And yet every household had, you know, it was a wealthy country in the UK. There was a burgeoning middle class, sugar, butter, milk, flour, eggs, the ingredients of cake and cookies have been cheap and abundant for many, many generations before we had childhood obesity. It is the store bought cookies with their availability and their marketing that have driven the, the epidemic. Hmm. I, I, it, it, is, it is a cynical, misleading, wrong-headed, immoral argument. It doesn't stand up to scientific scrutiny or moral scrutiny. It, it is, it is, it, the, these arguments are incredibly ugly. I remember in the 80s and the 90s, uh, ice cream was melting uh, almost instantaneously. You take it out of the freezer. But now the ice cream doesn't melt anymore and the bread can stay on the kitchen counter for like a week or yeah. two. And as consumers... If you don't inspect it, that seems great. You know, yeah. it's good for your wallet. Um, it's good. It's it's nice for kids. The ice cream no longer falls off the cone. You know, we remember the ice cream melting down our hands as yeah. kids. And, you know, it was never fun now. I mean, I start the book with my kids in the park on a, on a hot day. And I noticed my daughter handed me her bowl of ice cream. And she'd had it in her, her hot little hand with the sun shining on it for half an hour. And this ball was still a perfect ball. And that's because ice cream, the, I spoke to a, um, a scientist at an ice cream company who's, I mean, he, he died last week, actually. He's one of the most important characters in the book, Paul Hart. And he worked at Unilever for many years. And he said, the goal of the ice cream teams, the scientists, is to make ice cream that is stable at room temperature that tastes and looks like ice cream. It's a, it's a, a liquidy foam, but it's mm. hard. Um, and then you can transport it all over the world, do anything you want with it and only freeze it in the shop. And you would save 
so much money mm. and they haven't quite achieved it yet, but that is the goal because the cost of ice cream is partly eggs and cream. Well, you can get rid of the cream and you can get rid of the eggs very quickly. You, you can replace all the ingredients, but you do still have to keep it quite cold. But the, the ice cream that we ate as children, you had to keep it minus 18 very constantly. Now it can warm up easily to minus two. You know, you can have much looser times, much warmer vans driving it around the country. So, yeah, I mean, and the re the way it does it is because it's full of these gums. So if you, I haven't looked at Norwegian ice cream, maybe for the obvious reason I'm here in January, <laughs> and I haven't wanted an ice cream, um, but uh it's probably full of guar gum, locust yeah. bean gum, carrageenan, xanthan gum, exactly. and these the uh, mixed with the emulsifiers and, uh, and and the very particular fats that are used, you create this very stable foam. And it's a good experiment. I mean, get your ice cream at home, make it, put a scoop in a bowl, leave it for yeah. half an hour, and see what it tastes like. It's a, it's a it's a it's a foamy slime. It's like eating a slimy piece of you know furniture. Marie Colby uh, talked me into buying an ice cream machine. She had one at home and we were talking about it in the show and everybody started uh, buying ice cream machine. And so th this is the question is like, it, ice cream that you make at home is basically milk and eggs and sugar. And you should not eat that for breakfast for sure. But as a dessert, it's got loads of nutrients in it and it will fill you up and you will not put as much sugar in that ice cream as they do in the factory because you'll be adding the sugar and go, oh, this, this is a lot of sugar. So no, homemade ice cream is, I think, a a reasonable part of a healthy diet, yeah. you know, but mainly, you know, it's a hassle to make and you'll find that you only eat ice cream once a week and it's a treat and you get out the ice cream maker and you've got to cool it down yeah. and buy the ingredients and it's a whole experience with the kids. It's also hard to scoop when it's, uh, when it's cold, you know, part of the logic. It, so a big ingredient in a lot of that 1980s ice cream, they started to add glycerol, which is uh, somewhat like antifreeze, which makes the soft scoop. Mm. So you can just scoop it out. And people love this, obviously, and yeah. no one no one ever reads ingredients. So um, before we go into your, your personal project uh, and your uh, experiment with uh, UPFs, um, why is there such a resistance among many health professionals to integrate the new knowledge on ultra processed foods? Well, I think the situation is the same in Norway as in the United Kingdom. We have, um, so we have a government scientific advisory committee on nutrition. They write the dietary guidelines, make the recommendations. They have 15 members on that panel. Seven of the members have past or current links to major ultra processed food producers. And there is an industry representative on that panel. So there is someone who still works in the food industry that sits on that panel. So that is a huge problem. And as a result, our scientific advisory committee says, well, we acknowledge there is some evidence, but we need to do more work. And this is what the tobacco industry did in the 60s is they said, well, we are a bit worried about this supposed link to cancer. So we're going to set up a tobacco research group with really good scientists and we are going to help solve this problem. And then they very successfully delayed regulation for about six decades. Mm. Um, so the food industry literally pay people on the government advisory committee. And I believe you have a similar situation in Norway from what, from what I understand. I, yeah. I should probably be a bit careful because I haven't fact checked that, but I, I'm led to believe that by several people. In the UK, our major charities that influence, charities are a huge part of this. Um, they appear independent. They're very public facing. The British Nutrition Foundation sounds legit, right? I mean, mm. they, they mm. sound good. They are majority funded by food producers. So they had a healthy eating week last year and it was sponsored by Coca-Cola. Now, I don't care what you say about ultra processed food. You and I do not have to agree on the evidence around UPF for us all to agree that a Coca-Cola is not a healthy drink. It's not a company with a healthy product pro portfolio portfolio, and they should not be sponsoring a healthy eating week in the UK. Um, we then have the university departments, and then we have a thing called the Science Media Centre who sort of take science stories and disseminate them to journalists. They are funded by Nestle, Procter & Gamble, and Food and Drink Europe. Mm. So we have this eco, and then we have all the doctors and the influencers, uh, the media kind of personalities involved in health and wellness, and they are also. So the food industry has this total grip. So I don't see it really as like the health authorities 
resisting. I just see it as industry behaving like the tobacco industry. And to, it's not, we should not be surprised that the food industry behaves like the tobacco industry. Partly the financial incentives are the same. The, the pension funds also own the tobacco industry. But the tobacco industry and the food industry for a long time were the same industry. So in the 1980s, RJ Reynolds and Philip Morris were the two biggest tobacco companies. Mm. And they bought Nabisco, General Mills and Kraft and created the biggest food companies in the world. They then used these giant tobacco food companies, used their flavor molecule knowledge and their marketing technologies to sell addictive food, to create and market addictive foods. They created cartoon characters to sell the kids' food. They created loyalty programs for kids mm. that came from the loyalty programs for cigarettes. So Philip Morris had this Marlboro country store where you could buy kind of like outdoor cowboy gear and you got you got cigarette miles if you smoked enough Marlboros. They took exactly that format and they created for kids the Kool-Aid drink with a cartoon mascot and a loyalty program for kids. So kids drank enough Kool-Aid, they would get toys and um, uh, uh, fun merchandise and products all branded Kool-Aid. So uh, in the 2000s, they divested because it became hard to sell food when you were also selling cigarettes. If it, you know, everyone at this point was going, hmm, should we, should we buy this? So they, they separated again. Mm. But the ultra-processed products that are all around us, they have an evolutionary history that comes from essentially the same teams of marketeers and scientists that invented ways of selling cigarettes. So what that says to me is that they use their tobacco playbook so that so they're then also doing what tobacco did is they're buying scientists, they're polluting the literature, they're, they're funding science, they're, they're creating doubt. Doubt is their product. Confusion is their product. Um, cause you don't, you don't need people to disbelieve the science on ultra processed food. You just need people to go, Oh, I'm not sure. And the bread is cheaper. So I, I think I'll just keep doing what's easy. You just need doubt. Hmm. Um, so we now need to use the playbook for tobacco control against the food. So I, I don't know, I, sometimes I'm optimistic, sometimes I'm pessimistic. Coming here, meeting Marit, meeting the other scientists you work with, I feel optimistic. And I think in Norway, you have an opportunity to stop this process. Yeah. So you, you're very vulnerable here, but basically Norway is a healthy country. You have tall, strong, well people. You have much more social justice and equality than we have in the UK and you have traditional food. So you will have your food system destroyed by transnational food corporations in a decade. Yeah. But uh, I, I guess in the UK and the US, uh, the money are so big when it comes to getting the best scientists, the best marketers. Uh, and the big food industry is, is probably getting the best people available to manipulate uh, the single customer. So it's, uh, it's, it's the most the brilliant asymmetry, people. Yeah. The asymmetry is amazing. So yeah. if you think of the marketing, but just the marketing budget of one of the big food companies might be three to 6 billion US dollars a year. Okay. The entire annual operating budget of the World Health Organization is probably less than the marketing budget of any one of these companies. And remember the World Health Organization is doing pandemic surveillance, uh, smoking control, non-communicable disease, infections, malaria, HIV, it's doing everything. So, you know, if you look at the forces, you know, you say, I, you know, UNICEF are a great ally. So UNICEF no longer take any money from any company that makes any ultra processed food. And that's for any program. So their vaccine program cannot be funded by a company that makes any UPF. You know, so you think, well, UNICEF, we all love UNICEF. They're a very credible UN aligned organization. Mm. You know, they're all about kids. They're incredibly strong. But the UNICEF operating budget is like, is nothing. And they're working around the globe on all, all different aspects of child health. So the, the power of industry is, is incredible. And people should be terrified of that. You know, people, people worry about big government. I think. In Scandinavia, maybe you worry about this left, but people people are terrified of big government and government overreach. At yeah. least we vote for our governments. Yeah. You know, we have control. We can get rid of a government. At the moment, we are having corporations decide our future, decide government policy, decide um, how our world runs. And that, that to me, is, is profoundly wrong. You know, it's kind of a paradox, but um, 
the most powerful thing about marketing and maybe the most brilliant thing about marketing is that people don't believe in the facts of marketing. I am told this, I love that you brought this up. So I spoke to a, a, a special advisor inside Downing Street mm. and I said, how do the food lobbyists exert power? Like, how, do they bribe you? Are they paying the prime minister? Do they pay MPs? How does it work? And he said, oh, no, no, lobbying, lobbying doesn't work. It never works. You know, we have to like listen to them, but we don't believe anything they say. Mm. And I was like, oh, right. So then I kind of went away and looked at the ecosystem and the marketing that he didn't think was working is the problem is all the basic science, all those charities, all the, all the, the documents, all the information flowing toward Downing Street, toward our government is supported by industry and government never meets the tiny NGOs that aren't funded by industry. Because why would you bother meeting? There's a charity called First Steps Nutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, they are essentially a two person charity. They do the most amazing work. They have these two people working around the clock, producing all this incredible documentation, trying to lobby government for better regulation. Um, government don't meet them. Like, why would you meet this tiny little charity when you could meet the British Nutrition Foundation with a list of five, 50 professors, all paid by the food industry? Mm. So, yeah, that's a form of marketing. And the, the marketeers always say, oh, no, no, no. Burger ads just switch kids from that burger to this burger. They don't... They don't make kids buy more burgers. They just drive burger preference. We have Emma Boyland is a professor professor at University of Liverpool. She's a, a colleague. And she um, she's done great work to show that if you advertise fresh food for, to children, they end up eating more junk food if junk food is available. Like marketing really works. That's why companies have billion dollar marketing budgets. Yeah. I did an investigation of the infant formula industry mm -hmm. and the investigation was about this diagnosis of cow's milk protein. This is going to sound a bit niche, but it is relevant. Um, there was a diagnosis where women who are breastfeeding their children uh, were being told that their children could be allergic to their the mother's breast milk. If the mother drank dairy milk, the dairy could get into the breast milk and the child could be allergic to cow's milk. <sighs> and so the way, what the mother has to do is to exclude all dairy, even the tiniest little bit of dairy, um, for four weeks and see if the child improves. And then to prove the diagnosis, they have to start drinking dairy, see if the child gets worse. Anyway, these guidelines to diagnose these children, uh, the symptoms were, and anyone who's got a, an infant can think about this, um, rashes, crying, sleepiness, sleeplessness, constipation, diarrhea, colic, burping, wind, a normal child, right? Like every single child has all of these symptoms. Um, so it was impossible to exclude the diagnosis. Even as I was investigating the guidelines promoting this diagnosis, um, it turned out, of course, they were all funded by the companies making the specialist formulas to treat the problem. I, My wife was breastfeeding our daughter, Lyra, and I said, you know, I think she's crying. I think we should go dairy-free. So even though I was, I was proving these guidelines were nonsense and yeah. they were written by people paid by industry... I was still affected and we came off dairy for several weeks. <laughs> and of course, Lyra, like all babies, kept, you know, yeah. pooing and belching and getting colic and not sleeping. And that's what babies do. So we are all vulnerable. I don't care if you've got a medical degree, we're still vulnerable to marketing. Yeah. And it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the feeling that uh, how can I, be, how can I uh, be right and everyone else uh, is wrong? That, that's that's uh, that's a hard feeling. It's, it's, it's hard to explain. And hard to um, to argument that thing uh, to just your neighbors, your family. So you have a big burden of proof. You, you you have a huge burden of proof, and I I spend a lot of time trying to make sure I don't sound like a a crank. I mean, the, the problem in this space when when you and I discuss food, diet, nutrition is there's so much. Um, Nonsense. And so, and everyone says, oh, I have the answer. Keto, paleo, yeah. my latest supplement, uh, particular vitamins. We've all got our own answer. The evidence around UPF is not like one clinical study. This is, you know, this is really good public health. And, and what I would say is people listening in Norway, remember that the French government believe this. Okay. So if I was in France, um, 
There are certain countries the book is doing extremely well in. In France, the book uh, is published and it, it, you know, it's got a nice review, but people are not very interested because they're like, well, this is completely obvious. This is what our government is already saying. So we don't need more information about this. And the mm. French government is very clear. Cook food at home, try and eat minimal ultra-processed food, less than 15% of your calories. It's like completely obvious to the French. Um, in Norway, I think you're in a more interesting space where people are excited, people are angry, people want to eat well, mm. people are educated, they understand this. In the UK, the problem is, I don't know, may, maybe unsolvable, but I don't know, we got there with tobacco. Okay, now- Am I persuading you? Like, do you think, I mean, you can be honest. Am I sounding like a, like a, like a crank, like an outlier, like someone who is, who is pushing, who's trying to sell my book, I guess. That's the other accusation oh. I get is you're just trying to flog your book. I don't care if anyone buys the book, by the way. I, I feel like there's so much free information online. If you can't afford my book, please go and read B. Wilson's article in The Guardian, which is like a three-page version of my book and is absolutely brilliant and is free. Thanks to Mark Colby. And I'm a, I'm a bit of a free thinker myself and I like to find my way in, in the food world, so to speak, to find what's worked best for me and for my workout, my health. And I, I think it's fun to like try out and experiment with my own health, what, what's working, what's not working. And uh, so I'm actually pretty deep in into um, that personal experience. I'm not, uh, I'm leaving the knowledge and the scientific uh, things to, to Marit and, and those guys. And I just have fun just trying out different diets and food and, and talking about here on the podcast. You can learn, I, I mean, my, My invitation to the reader, so in, in my book, I don't give anyone any advice. I'm not selling anyone a lifestyle. My invitation is to keep eating the food because the the way you get around the marketing is by really looking at the food. So a good experiment is by your, uh, Pringles are a good example, but you can do this with any flavored crisps and get them out of the packet and crush them into a powder and eat the powder with a spoon and see how it tastes then. Mm. Once you get rid of, the technology of the shape and the structure, it tastes very, very different. And that's ultra processing. That's how you learn what the ultra processing is doing. Out of the tube, they're much less interesting. That brings us to to your, um, let's call it a scientific skin in the game experiment. Um, where you put yourself on an ultra processed diet, food diet. Um, tell us a little bit about the experiment. First, how did you set up the diet and the daily eating routines and for how long did you intend to go? So um, it was an experiment in the sense that we did it very rigorously because I was the first patient in a much bigger trial that we're now running. So we, I did this with uh, my colleagues in the nutrition department at UCL. You know, we weren't doing this casually and it wasn't an extreme diet. So I ate a normal diet for a British teenager, 80% of my calories from UK food. There'll be lots of people in Norway who get 80% of their calories from UPF. Mm. So I did a four week washout, no UPF at all, incredibly hard. I really craved it. And I really was excited to do this diet because it gave me permission to go and eat all the food that middle-aged doctors with kids, <laughs> you know, I'd stopped eating Nutella with a spoon and I didn't have um, Cocoa Pops for breakfast and I didn't get KFC takeaway every night. Mm. Am I okay mentioning brands? Sorry, I've been, yeah, sure. I've been doing it, you know. No I mean, I'm mentioning lots of brands. They're all, they're all the same. Um, so I was excited to do the diet and for two weeks I enjoyed it, but I became quite ill. And I didn't know until I stopped eating the food at the end really how unwell I had become because The weird thing about eating food is it doesn't make us instantaneously ill. If you have a dinner of ultra processed food, it's usually got a very high salt content and you eat it to excess. So you go to bed full of salt and full and like full of, full of food and you don't sleep very well. If you're my age, you get up and you pee, you often can't go back to sleep. You become constipated. It's quite low in fiber. Mm. So you get piles and bum problems and gastric problems. Um, And as you get more tired, uh, we all know when we're tired, we eat, we eat worse food, you get a stress response. So you often solve your fatigue and your heartburn and your belly pain by eating and drinking more ultra processed food. Yeah. But you locate the stress 
with the people in front of you. When your kids are misbehaving, you're screaming at your kids. Kids, my kids behave, misbehave or behave very constantly. Whether I scream at them is entirely about how much sleep I've had. Mm. And so I, I became very difficult for my wife and kids, I think, to live with. And I started feeling like all my patients. So I aged a lot. So the scientific results were, were interesting. And I, I was, remember, I did not do this. I wasn't forcing the food in. And I did it as something of a skeptic. So I was not persuaded about that all this was, was real. Um, the, there were three kind of big effects. I gained a lot of weight, six kilos. I've never really lost that weight. So I still have my kind of UPF tummy. Losing weight at my age is very, very hard. Wow. Um, I would have doubled my body weight in, uh, in a year if I'd kept eating. So, and this is what my twin happened to my twin brother. Was this the last year or? No, no, this was, uh, hold on, when was it? 20, 20. It, it was, it was first year of the pandemic. It was late. I think it was late 2020. Okay. Um, so I gained a lot of weight. We did brain scans and my brain scans very significantly changed. And th so this, you could say, well, this is just one patient, but these, you know, I was working with the top medical physicists and the neurophysiologists at UCL at our national center for neurology, and they set all the thresholds. So we're very clear these were big changes. Nothing else big in my life had changed. So we're pretty sure it was the diet. And we saw the back of my brain, the automatic behavior bit, the cerebellum, much more connected to the addiction reward bits in the middle. What exactly that means, we don't entirely know. It's consistent with the kind of scans we do in people with addiction problems. Um, and it's really worrying because if you see these kind of functional changes in me, in my forties, what's it doing to children who eat this diet all the way through their brain development? What's it doing to their, their learning about nutrients and food? Um, so, and, and then we saw my hormone response to a meal change. So when you, when you eat food, your body releases signals. Um, when you're hungry, you've got hunger hormones. When you're full, you've got fullness hormones. At the end of the diet, when I ate a meal, my hunger hormones uh, didn't decrease and my fullness hormones didn't really increase. So we saw a big, a big change in the hormone response. But the, the most interesting thing was midway through the diet, mm. I had a conversation with this colleague in Brazil and she just kept saying, this isn't real food. And that was the moment I became disgusted. So, and it's only when we, we leave an addiction behind that I was able to go, oh, wow, I was... I was really addicted. To how, how, how did she say that? So let me see if I can do it for people now. Save, save people money on the book. Um, <laughs> sorry, my <laughs> poor publicist sitting in the corner there. Um, but I do want, I, 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 the problem with the book is it's going to cost you, you know, I, uh, I don't know what it is in Norway, 20 pounds in the UK. Like the people who need the book the most can't afford the book. And the people who need the book the least uh, are all going to buy it and try and they're going to get worried about emulsifiers. She kept saying to me, This is not food. Its purpose is profit. Food's purpose is to nourish people and it's created with love and affection and to bind a community together. Ultra processed food is an industrially produced edible substance. It is not food by any normal definition. And she kept saying it. And I, in, during the phone call, I didn't notice particularly. Hmm. And that night I ordered, in the book actually, I, it's a turkey Twizzler that I eat. The, the the reason it, when you write a book, you have to sort of spread facts out and that it was actually KFC hot, hot wings, but I'd already written about KFC earlier in the book. So I made it a turkey twizzler. The the effect was the same. So I sat down to eat these this food and um, I just couldn't finish them. They became disgusting. So they tasted the same, mm. but I felt like I could taste that the spices weren't real. They're spice extracts. You could taste there's... Uh, I, 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 the recipe for KFC isn't available in the UK, but I felt like, so I can't confirm this, but in, in Canada, there would be flavor enhancers. So the Canadian recipe is flavor enhancers. There's a thing called dimethyl polysiloxane, which is used in the oil as an anti-foaming agent. There's lots of weirdness. The chicken is brined. So they, I went from being in love to, to falling out of love very quickly. Wow. So people, we don't understand this process very well in, in science. Um, love and disgust, those very strong emotions are quite closely linked. You can, people will know this from their romantic lives, from 
relationships with drugs, alcohol, cigarettes. You can love and hate a thing at the same time. You can be very attracted toward a thing and then mm. suddenly repulsed. And we know smokers particularly report this kind of sudden revulsion. And so the book, I have tried to write the book in a way that if you eat along by the end of the book, you will not want the food anymore. Um, and I don't promise that will be the effect, but lots of people have written to me and went, oh, I, I did your experiment and now I don't want the food. And I've had to buy a bread maker and an ice cream maker because I can't <laughs> eat it anymore. And uh, I don't make my own bread. I, I buy it, but. So you don't eat any UPF now? I, um, almost none. I don't want it. I almost don't crave it. I really don't crave it. There are tiny little moments. Some of my kids' sweets, when they have some jelly beans. Yeah. I still like a jelly bean, I guess. But I, I don't really, it's not, it's not a problem. It's like sometimes like you see someone having a beer and you think, oh, I'd like a beer. But then it's the middle of the day and you don't have a beer. Um, uh, th there are moments I eat it to be polite. I went out last night in Oslo. We, we had a late talk. I went to a bar with my mother-in-law and mm. actually loads of the people who'd come to this talk I'd given with Marit. And uh, the only food available was uh, like a platter of meat and cheese and bread. Now, I don't know if the bread was ultra processed or not, but I ate it, you know, it was late. And I was very self-conscious. All these people had just been listening to me <laughs> on stage, watching me eat this meat. But, you know, it was like Parma ham. I, that's not UPF. It's just ham and salt, yeah. pork and salt. So what? yeah, almost never, but I will eat it to be polite. Um, it, my kids are not forbidden. So my kids eat quite a lot of it, oh, yeah. eat it at school. But I, I tr my, my six-year-old is good. You know, she understands there is good food. She will eat fruit and vegetables. She likes treats, but she, they never, the one thing they never have is fizzy, fizzy soda. They don't have pop, you know. Mm. I think that's, that's probably the worst thing you can have. Yeah. So. What was the impact on your mental health during this experiment? What happened to me was exactly what all the evidence says. So I became very anxious and very unhappy. And hmm. we don't know why it happened. So we, look, it's very, it's not hard to imagine there are several things going on. The food contains a lot of additives that we think may directly affect the brain. The food contains a lot of additives that inflame your body And if you inflame your whole body, you inflame your brain. You know, brain is part of your body and that's probably not good. But you also, I think mental health, if you are not in control of any aspect of your life, it causes stress and anxiety, whether that is a, a drug, whether that is your work or whether that is your food intake. Mm. Um, and I was not in control. So, um, and I was gaining weight and I was aching. I was sort of in pain and... So, and I was constipated. I mean, if you, if you can't have a poo, then it makes you feel unhappy, you know? Mm -hmm. So there were, I think that was probably driven by a lot of different stuff. When I stopped the diet, I was so happy to stop. And within, I mean, within one day, I felt better. Within 72 hours, I'd had two good nights sleep. I, it was like the weather had changed. I mean, it was just unbelievable. I felt so much better. And I said to my wife, God, I'm so sorry. This is... <laughs> I was like, please, this is, but I, it was like, I'd been, it was like an addict in the throes of a, of a binge, mm. not really in control of themselves. Did you go into a fast or uh, did you go into raw food or? No, well, no. For, um, so first of all, I went, and uh, so this is, I hope one of the things that means I'm not an extremist. So I went, I was like, now I'm only going to eat, eat non-UPF. Uh, but all the evidence says if you don't eat UPF, you'll lose weight. So I went to my local, I've got this very good delicatessen in my house and I put like ham and cheese, mm. I put all this delicious food and I actually gained even more weight. Um, <laughs> so you can gain weight if you're in your mid forties and you start eating very delicious, yeah. uh, fancy non-UPF food. Um, then then I sort of cleaned up a bit and uh, and lost a bit of weight. But I mean, weight loss is... It's hard, you know. Anyone looking at me on the coming to Oslo will be like, oh, he's, you know, I'm, 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 a, 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 I'm, I'm slender build. I'm not broad shouldered, but I have a, I have a gut, and it's not, it's not trivial losing that. So, and it's, it's harder the bigger you are. So I'm very, I'm very aware that weight loss is hard. What were your personal reflections on this journey afterwards? Mainly that the whole thing 
this whole experience, there is a there is a vulgarity to it that I'm aware of that mm. I am able to dip into this nightmare that, that, that for some people is mandatory. And so no one has kind of objected to this, but I was really going and eating like someone who didn't have much money for a while. And um, I was able to leave that world and return to a food environment that's very different. And most people cannot do that. And in Norway, I think this is a less big problem. You have less poverty, here, you have less social injustice, but there will be many people in Norway who cannot afford to eat real food. Real, real food spoils very quickly. Um, it's very expensive per calorie. If you go and buy broccoli per kilo, it's some of it's the same price as beef per kilo and you've got to prepare it and cook it. You've got to own knives and chopping boards and a yeah, yeah. fridge and blah, blah, blah. So um, my main feeling is that I am very fortunate that I can afford to eat good food. And, and I think my, my desire is to change the food environment for people who uh, are born in very different circumstances to the ones I was born in. That, di that discovery of being disgusted by what you eat, I, I can I can recall I was 25 and we went on this cruise ship and there was, I was so disgusted by uh, the lunch there where people were throwing, uh, filling their two plates. Each, the all you can eat. All you can eat uh, with uh, lots of processed and ultra processed food. And I was so disgusted by looking at other people that I... Uh, We're, so, we're so eating so um, so that disgusted uh, that disgusting aspect is probably uh, similar to um, hitting rock bottom in uh, in psychology and stuff like that. I think that's right. There's a knife edge here. Yeah. I want to make my readers disgusted. I, that is, I'm open about that. Mm. At the same time, I don't want to shame anyone who has to use this food. And so there is a there is a knife edge here. How we talk about yep. these products is is very difficult. And I think the this audience on this show, I would imagine, it's probably okay to discuss many of them. That they they can afford, they'll be able to motivate change. You know, they live in a part of the world where they can. I'm very uneasy about having that conversation in some environments. You know, you don't want to discuss to people about things they can't avoid. It's it's frightening and it drives anxiety. So, and the, the food industry used this argument, of course, that you're shaming people, that sure. why would you want to demonize healthy food? I, I mean, I think it's very important. We we discuss these health harms, that they're, they're real. No one has to be terrified. The food is not toxic. Eating some of it occasionally is no more harmful than having the occasional beer. The problem is if your diet is all UPF or your diet is all beer, that is where you get the problems. Mm. Yeah, back to that nagging part. It's It doesn't work. The nagging... Uh, so I, my mother-in-law has come with me on this, mm -hmm. this tour and uh, she's very wonderful. She's an ex-psychologist and, uh, and, and an ex-psychoanalyst. And her advice, she's got this brilliant line where she says, advice is an uneasy commodity. And I don't, I've never known really what she means, but she is absolutely meticulous about never giving advice. And she lives with us and she never gives us advice about parenting, about anything. Love it. And, uh, but when you go to her with a problem, she will hand it back to you and make you inspect it. And I think that what I want to do with people is not to tell, I don't, I hope I'm, everyone wants me to tell them what to eat or actually in Norway, this isn't true. But in the UK, every week I get a call from a journalist going, what's the worst ultra processed food? What should people not feed their children? And I refuse to engage with those questions. But what I do want to do is to ask people what they think they should eat and what they feel instinctively is good for their children mm. and what they can afford. You shouldn't, you shouldn't give advice to anyone unless you have a part of uh, the downside. If you're not affected by the downside of, of your advice, it, advice is completely, in my opinion, worthless. Yeah, I, I, that, that's, that's a very important reflection. You mentioned responsibility earlier. There is a, there is a kind of idea that we all have a, res a social responsibility to be healthy, mm -hmm. to be economically productive. And I think I violently reject that. None of us asked to be born. 
none of us are obliged to our politicians. And in the UK particularly, we have politicians sort of saying, you know, people just need to eat well and do exercise, even as those same politicians have created a world in which real food is unaffordable, unhealthy food is marketed aggressively, exercise is almost impossible because our cities are dedicated to motor vehicles, air quality is awful, crime is high. And so I, I, I just don't feel anyone needs advice. What we all need is a world to be created where we can be economically productive. And then, you know what? Almost everyone wants to work hard and be healthy. I don't, mm. You know, I see, you know, patients the whole time. And I, I just hardly ever meet anyone who, who wants to not do stuff. Everyone wants to get out of bed, go to work, be productive. We've got so much evidence about this. So, so, so how do you do it then? It's, it's like, if you're a policymaker, I think it's really straightforward. You're my ambition. So people think I want everyone to eat less ultra processed food. I really don't. I do not care what you eat, mm -hmm. what y'all eats, what I eat, what everyone, anyone feeds their kids. As long as people aren't harming each other, I don't care. I do care about the planet, but when it comes to health, it's your choice. But at the moment, you don't have a choice. You're just surrounded by rubbish and, and the real food is submerged. So my argument is just give people choice. And what we know is when people have choice, people with money and resources don't eat lots of ultra processed food. Wealthy people have personal chefs who cook minimally processed food for them all day. That's, mm. that's how it works. So the goal of policy, I think, should just be to protect people from predatory corporations, uh, to protect people from other nations, I suppose, and to enable people to have freedom without encroaching on the freedom of others. And when we give people choices, people, people are sensible. If you give poor people money, mm. they spend it in sensible ways. You know, uh, it's, I, I think this stuff is, is not very complicated in the end. And, and policymakers with cigarettes, everyone can go and smoke Now it's a bit harder, it costs you more money, mm. but the information is on the packet and people now choose to not smoke. No, smoking is not banned. You know, you can, you can go and be a smoker and we all choose not to because we've been given that freedom and we need the same freedom from the food. What about people's food choices and preferences? We do have the opportunity to buy both ultra processed food and raw food today, but raw food is, is more expensive as we talked about. But Most of us tend to buy the quick and easy ultra processed foods and products as a path of maybe least of um, a path of least resistance, both to save time and energy in the kitchen. And uh, I would say even in Norway, even despite the best efforts of Marit and other people to promote the concept of ultra processed food here, if you go into a supermarket, the food is not labeled as being unhealthy. So you can buy a can of cola, a chocolate bar, a unhealthy breakfast cereal. Now you might kind of instinctively know, but many of those things will health, have health claims. So what, in terms of what we need to really give people choice, if you want a proper free market with information, is we do what has been done in Mexico and Argentina and Colombia and many other countries in South America, which is you put warning labels on food. So mm. at the moment we have this red, orange, green traffic light system, Uh, it allows these health claims. What you need on a can of cola, for example, is a big black octagon warning about the calorie content and a big black octagon warning about the sugar or the sweetener content. Mm. Um, and then a, another box warning about colorings and caffeine. And that should be bigger than the logo of the cola. And that we know make allows people to choose not to buy cola. And there's no, without any tax on the cola, without increasing the price, people stop buying it. On breakfast cereals, and the same thing has happened where you've taken the cartoon. So once you put on black warning labels, it's not infringing your choice. It's giving you scientifically accurate information. And this is not about ultra processed food, by the way. The warning labels apply to salt, sugar, fat, sweeteners, which arguably are part of ultra processing, caffeine and colorings. Okay, so th these are not, and th these are not, this is not about labeling ultra processing as part of that definition. So the regulation is actually about this nutrient content. They've done it very cleverly. So it dis we use uh, thresholds that allow us to put octagons on mm. ultra processed food. Um, and what you see is it doesn't affect your freedom, but once you put two black, black octagons on a box of cereal and the tiger or the monkey or the elephant comes off the cereal, the kids don't want to eat it anymore. 
So it's not about price or making it, making it uh, affordable. I, I am not pushing the idea of taxes. Now, um, that's because in the UK, taxes would be regressive. They would penalize the most vulnerable people. Um, in some South American countries, they are starting to tax the food and it works well. In those countries, the UPF is actually, they are actually the the luxury products and they're quite high price. Interesting. So it's increasing the price more and the real food is cheaper. And there is still a lot of cultural knowledge about how to cook rice and beans and traditional food. In Norway, it might be complicated, but people can afford better food. Mm. So you tax is a, is a vexed issue. The warning labels without the tax work super well. Okay, let's say ultra processed food get taxed heavily and the raw food becomes much more cheaper than the ultra processed food. Will that alone change people's consumer behavior or? So this this goes back to your earlier excellent question of going, what is the purpose of doing this? Mm. If policy makers start trying to force people who aren't ready to stop eating UPF, it will fail. There will not be popular support. So if you introduce taxes too early and people feel like they're being told to eat their greens, eat their broccoli, I think it it won't work. So you have to be you have to be careful. But we know when we change the price of food, it dramatically alters what people eat. When you make free fruit and veg available, people drink people eat it. When you make whole milk available in schools, kids drink it. So there is definitely a role for shifting subsidies. I would I would rather do it at a higher level rather than taxing the products. I would shift other budgets. We have a food system that's subsidized, right? So we think that ultra processed food is cheap. Now it is cheap when you buy the bread or the candy bar or the, the ready meal. It's cheap at the point you buy it. It's very, very expensive later on. So in your taxes, you will pay for the healthcare costs. In your taxes, you will pay the mm-hmm. environmental costs. Um, the way the food is produced is these enormous monoculture crops, corn, rice, wheat, soy, plus palm, plus a bit of dairy, plus some meat. I mean, it's only, it's made of less than 10 species, basically, mm. um, plus synthetic additives. So we subsidize all that. So we could change the subsidy so that small producers got the money and real food was cheaper. And we could celebrate real food. We In France, when you buy chicken in the supermarket, there are lots of different types of chicken. Now, I'm guessing in Norway, if you buy a you buy a chicken to roast in the oven, mm. you just buy a chicken, don't you? It's um, there's you, two types. It's, uh, it's like organic, yeah, or, organic and uh, non-organic. Yeah. So in in the UK, we have organic or free range, and yeah, we've got we've got the welfare, but we've got basically one species of bird. In France, you can buy all these different types of bird that taste yeah. slightly different, and they celebrate that in the same way they have different types of cheese, and mm. you know, produce has a uh, um, uh, you know, a connection to its soil and its 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 um, its sort of heritage. So we could see the rise of whole food being more than just commodities. We should celebrate, you know, beef from Herefordshire grown on that particular grass and butter that comes from another part of the country and uh, potatoes grown in the soil in Norfolk. You know that those things could all be kind of celebrated. But instead, it's just potatoes are potatoes. And basically, potatoes in the UK used to make chips. So the food industry in Italy and France and maybe Spain uh, haven't uh, been able to penetrate the market uh, or... Well, they have. Well, that's interesting. Remember, the project of the 15 to 20 transnational food corporations that Vidas all, the project must be to destroy all traditional food culture. So if you read the... Um, uh, the the financial documents produced, the shareholder reports produced from these companies, mm. th- their ambitions are very clear. You know, the, there's a, I quote in the book, the chairman of Coca-Cola talking about the number of teenagers, the millions of teenagers around the world that have not had a Coca-Cola this week. Like, it's a, it's a massive opportunity. If there are teenagers that haven't had a Coca-Cola today or this morning or in the last hour, that's an opportunity for growth. Mm. So, Whilst Italy, the traditional pizza producers, have some power against the you know influx of Pizza Hut and Domino's, there you can go and I believe you can get Pizza Hut and Domino's in Italy. Italian coffee, there's Starbucks in Rome, you know, there's McDonald's in Paris. As I came into Oslo from the airport, I passed two 
two Burger Kings and two McDonald's yeah. <laughs> on the short journey from the airport to the hotel. Yeah. So it's like n there's nowhere that they won't reach and destroy everything. So for, I would suggest that France, Italy, Spain are further behind the the destruction of their food culture, mm. but it will be destroyed. All of the French cheese produce, the the wineries will all be bought by a few big wine producers. We will we will get consolidation and these monopolistic practices where there's a, oligopolies, a small number of companies. So what is the ultimate long-term goal here? Is it to eliminate ultra-processed food completely from the shelves? No. Or to regulate the market or facilitate and educate people? My, my, so I am involved in now trying to set up activism to bring out, bring about regulation that will improve human health equality and uh, make life better for people. So we think very carefully about, I don't want to force people to do stuff they don't want to do. The argument, the reason we make the arguments about money is because once you understand the flow of money and how the company's hands are tied, it makes the argument you have to have government regulation. So we're making this argument for, for big government. So the the hierarchy of things that must happen mm. are in Norway, it must go in your national nutrition guidance that yes, fat, salt, sugar, those foods high in those are harmful, but there is also evidence around ultra processed, industrially processed food. And those should make a small part of diet, especially for children. That is the, this guy, you know, you can look up the guidance in, you know, a dozen different countries and they've got great wording about, you know, cook at home. Mm. That's number one. End the conflicts of interest with the food industry. So as, if Nestle, Coca-Cola, McDonald's can't pay doctors and scientists, they can't function. So it should become very shameful to to take money from these companies. They used to be tobacco companies, for God's sake. Stop stop taking their money. It's disgusting. Yeah. Um, and then we need the octagons on the food. Very simple. Loads of evidence. It's been done in South America. It works brilliantly well. Then once food has octagons, well, you can't feed food with a black octagon to a child. So you, all the cartoon characters, there's no marketing. It stops being available in schools. And you're just, you're all the time shifting market forces away from that industry. It will never go away. People want soft bread and chocolate spread and cola drinks. I don't want to ban any of it, you mm. know. I, I I wouldn't ban anything. I would legalize most drugs of abuse. But capitalism, when it is well regulated, is an extraordinary tool for innovation, for lifting people out of poverty. Unregulated capitalism uh, is essentially slavery, monopolies, exploitation and human suffering. So hmm. we, I don't want a revolution. I want a tweak. And the fact that industry are resisting this so violently is exposing how vulnerable some of the big companies are. There, there are a few companies, a few of the big food companies that really have spent so much money on their shareholders. They've got almost nothing left in the bank. They can't evolve. They can't develop hmm. and they may collapse or they will see a devaluation and they'll be broken up and bought by other people. Um, we'll see the rise of new companies. Those people will not lose their jobs. We'll see. We'll see a new industry flourish. So, um, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, very optimistic about the ability of the financial system to cope with a couple of octagons on unhealthy food. And I'm really optimistic about the amount of money those octagons will save the state in healthcare budgets because we cannot afford the new drugs to treat obesity. No one can afford them. Mm. What's very cheap is to feed kids healthy food. Yeah. What about you? You're uh, with your book and your exposure and your position. Uh, what's your next project? What's your, what's your next move? What's, what are you going to do with this? So I'm, um, I work as a doctor. My academic work is more and more about financialization. This, this, this system by which corporations, we, we think of our companies as being like, there's a car company, there's a food company, there's a telecoms company. In fact, our car companies really function as banks. They lend us money to buy cars. Many of our food companies own real estate or they function as commodity banks. So if we look at the really big food producers, they make a lot of their money on trading contracts around uh, commodity uh, prices. They're not really in the business of making food. And I think exposing the 
frailties and the vulnerabilities of the of, of the economic system is really important to understand the the bigger picture of ultra processing because the phrase ultra processing because that processing idea we think of ultra processing as very much being about like the food processing the machines and the additives ultra processing is just a system of technologies and design processes to create addictive products and so i think my the next bit of work is really looking uh outside of food and going what are the other big industries that affect human health because we've we've done tobacco there is a lot of agreement i think amongst the public oh yeah food is also addictive yeah it was made by tobacco companies maybe we should regulate it in the same way i think people are coming around mm. alcohol vapes technology do we need to start thinking about the financial incentives in those systems how addictive those things are and start thinking about regulating them in the same way so this is not about taking away anyone's fun mm. this is much more about going let's create freedom and information for people across other sectors does that make sense yeah absolutely have you thought dive, to dive into the, like the british drinking culture perhaps <laughs> like drinking for uh, alcohol for like 30 days so <laughs> I mean, I could not keep up with British drinking culture. So we have an amazing thing in the UK where when you buy a bottle of booze, when you buy a pack of cigarettes, it is a plain pack and it says smoking kills on the packet. And you can't see the cigarettes in the shop. They're behind a counter. Yep. Now, when you buy alcohol, there are alcohol advertisements everywhere in the UK. And every shop will sell you bottles of hard liquor and alco pops. And, and on the bottle, there is often a pr- picture of a pregnant woman with a glass of wine and her hand on her belly and a, a circle with a line through it. So <laughs> pregnant women shouldn't drink. Although there is a picture of someone who is pregnant drinking and underneath it says, enjoy responsibly. That is our regulatory slogan. Now imagine if the cigarette said, enjoy responsibly. It's like the instruction is to enjoy them. Mm. The charity that regulates alcohol consumption and marketing is called drink aware like do drink the reason it's called drink aware is because who fund who is the majority funder the alcohol industry so it's mm-hmm. diageo's all the major booze producers fund the public health campaign our gambling charity gamble aware and it says the slogan is something like uh st- when the fun stops you should stop I like gambling is fun so don't gamble if it's not it's like saying you know cocaine just stop when you think you have a problem mm-hmm. the whole point of alcohol cocaine and gambling is by the time it stopped being fun you can't stop that's the point so i mean yes alcohol so many of my colleagues i do food many of my academic colleagues do alcohol vapes Yeah. I don't know what your situation here is vapes in the UK uh yeah, same we have like pi- these incredible um beautiful like white luscious sort of high tech shapes they're very they're like little uh, apple mm. earpod devices and they're like pineapple and tropical fruit flavor they smell amazing I mean, it's all about getting kids addicted you know? energy drinks is huge in norway now the energy drinks are just and it's this incredible branding is like sport health energy yeah. no 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 it's it's exactly. refined sugar addictive drugs and very weird additives i mean there and a lot of caffeine um, mo- most of the products here in always is, is sugar free so uh, it's all about the caffeine and, and the additives i guess and we don't understand so pe- if you talk to people with diet drink addictions uh, many people will drink you know di- diet coke there was a very big piece in the new york times but people drink 10 9 10 cans a day. Mm. We have no idea what drives that addiction. So we know that with the food the reward molecules are sugar and fat. If you can inject the sugar and fat in high dose very quickly using all the additives and the flavors and it's very soft, that's how that seems to be what the molecules that drive the reward, although they're not addictive on their own. When you have a diet drink, no one understands why they become addictive because there's nothing mm. there's nothing in there. They're the caffeine and the sweeteners seem to be doing something but it's 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 not clear at all no one knows i mean pr- almost certainly the the drinks companies do know uh, because they fund they funded previously a lot of quite good research that then some of which got published my, my take on that is is the caffeine uh, i quit uh, coffee drinking just to see how the body reacts and how's that going <laughs> it's hard in the the first two weeks um if you like go cold turkey it's it's 
very hard, but um, once you're off it, it's. I do it sometimes you don't, you on the don't weekend. Go back. I don't have a coffee and I get terrible headaches. Yeah, yeah. We think we think coffee is pretty harmless. Coffee seems to be quite good for you. I mean, people are always trying to prove that coffee is bad for you because it would be interesting. Yeah, and it doesn't seem to be bad for you. Caffeine, if you have various heart conditions, uh, can precipitate arrhythmias and palpitations, but it's not very harmful, but it is quite addictive. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big difference drinking one or two cups a day and like 10 cups a day. So uh, the addiction gets harder with the more cups. That's my take. The, the interaction of these brands with sport, energy, mm. exercise was one of the other really intriguing bits of the book. Because when, when you set out to write a book, it's not all about weight, obviously, but weight is the thing that draws many people to this subject. So many of us yeah. want to live at a lower weight. Um, and so I was, I was sure that I was probably writing about 50% of the problem because obviously some of the fact we're all gaining weight must be to do with our screens. We don't walk to work anymore. We don't mm. work in a mine or on a farm. We sit at desks with computers and... So my big question was like, how much of the problem is really inactivity? And I wanted to do a chapter going, look, there's a whole other thing here that you should know about. And that that's the subject for another book. And as I looked into it, it became increasingly clear that inactivity, especially in children, mm. plays almost no role in weight gain. Maybe it's 5%, but uh, all of the research saying that you can exercise and burn off energy. I mean, perhaps not all of it, but like an incredible network of thousands of scientific papers was funded by Coca-Cola. Um, and in, like a proper conspiracy that was exposed by an amazing journalist at the New York Times called Anahad O'Connor, um, who's like, what he's, I mean, he is somewhat like Marit. He, he, mm. he was on this story in 2016 and he exposed this network with, with a guy called uh, um, uh, Yoni Friedhoff in, in Canada. Um, so an incredible bit of investigation. Meanwhile, there was this, so Coca-Cola were producing all this misinformation very skillfully, very secretly, as well as funding the Olympics and sponsoring all the energy drinks, sponsoring every sporting event and creating a general like Coke energy is good. Meanwhile, there was then, um, a huge amount of research showing that being active does not seem to massively change the number of calories you burn. Mm. Research going back to the 1990s and all drawn together by an incredible guy called Herman Ponser. And um, so exercise is really, really, really good for us, but it doesn't seem to have much effect on the total calories we burn. Yeah. When I post that on social media, fitness people and gym rats they are going, going nuts and crazy. They hate it. <laughs> I mean, it, that was the biggest pushback I got was yeah. the kind of gym rats. Um, <laughs> I love that. I mean, look, so I got a guy who did, who's, who'd done some Arctic exploration, sending me a kind of very mocking tweet going, uh, you should see my calorie burn when I went to the North Pole. Now, I also have done lots of Arctic exploration. So I, as a young doctor, I spent loads of time in the, at the North Pole. And so I did lots of research. And I when I went to the Arctic and I spent all day skiing across polar ice, I burned 8,000 calories a day, definitely, no sweat. If you cycle in the Tour de France, you will burn five to 8,000 calories a day. So you can do it, but the kind of activity that you sustain for many years, the the, the exercise we all do, going to the gym twice a week, mm. um, even being a farmer or a miner doesn't significantly change the energy you burn. And the reason seems to be, and this is why exercise is good for you, is you and I, broadly men of similar age, similar build, you're younger than me and slightly similar, but um, we will burn, let's say 3000 calories a day. Now, if you do quite a lot of exercise, it won't change from 3000 calories a day or not, not by much. You will steal energy from other budgets. So you will take energy from inflammation, anxiety, depression, so you will feel better and you'll be able to. Meanwhile, if I don't do any exercise, I sit typing at my desk, I still burn 3000 calories a day but I have to spend that energy now on inf inflammation, high reproductive hormone levels that are, that are bad for you and, and anxiety. So this is why exercise is good for us. And it's why exercise doesn't help us lose weight. Cause it, so it's a very, very beautiful story and people just, just hate it so much because 
I don't know. People hate the idea that I think lots of us do exercise because we we want to burn calories. Yeah. And unless you are doing it's logical hours, it's lo the human body is a machine. Look, I. I have a medical degree and a, a PhD in molecular biology. This is how I understood my body until I wrote the book. Mm. And I would say that in, with the really good metabolic scientists, this is not controversial. Everyone agrees that if you cycle in the Tour, you do burn more calories, but you can only cycle in the Tour de France for a few weeks before you become really ill. You can only do Arctic exploration for a couple of months before you become really ill. And I know that because I went to Greenland for 99 days. I burned 8,000 calories a day for three months. Wow. I became extremely ill uh, and got back. You know, I got the scurvy. <laughs> all, all kinds of terrible things happened, like all of these expeditions. Uh, so you can do it, but it, you can't sustain it. Looking forward to post this bit on social media now. <laughs> <laughs> Hey. Bring it on. <clears throat> Look, you, you're going to talk to my friend uh, Annette Drongland uh, in a couple of minutes in this studio, actually. Um, you met her last night? I did, yeah. Am yeah. I going to have to... I, so, now, are your audience is the same. Do, should I... Um, She's a doctor, so she has to be a, a little bit more professional and thoroughly than me. <laughs> so I can just... You have this uh, this bar over here and... Uh, oh, we see the, big, yeah, we haven't yeah. got into the... Um, What have you got? Some brandy? I get, and I get everything. Oh, some some Aquavit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Aqu Aqu actually, there's some homemade liquor as well in the Fanta bottle. Oh, I thought it didn't look like Fanta. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, it's not try uh, some non UPF homemade homemade uh, spirits. Yeah. yeah. Very it's, good. It's called. Why am I brent på på engelska, Jarl? Moonshine. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you, is it no, is it moonshine in Norwegian? Uh, I'm not sure. It's, it's How do you translate it? Brent. What does does that translate? It's a home, home brew. Home, home brew. Yeah, yeah, home, yeah. home brew. Yeah. But um, it was really nice uh, talking to you. It's so interesting talking to you. Well, I, I hope I hope some people listening are are persuaded. And I, I do want to say, if if people are struggling, you know, we we we've talked a lot, and some of it's maybe been lighthearted, but people really suffer because of this food. Mm. The food that they are binge on, they're addicted to, it's always ultra processed food. And and, and those people who are suffering, you know, they, they really have my my love and my sympathy. And, and you know, I, I, I and quite a few others are working really hard to try and make the world an easier place for people who are struggling with an addiction to these foods. I love your work and I love this talk and I recommend everyone to check out ultra processed people if you want the British version, the original version or Just ultra processed in Norway. Y'all, what happened to the title in Norway? It's short. <laughs> Look, I'm here with my Norwegian <laughs> publishers. Buy the Norwegian. <laughs> Bye. Uh, good luck with Anetta and the next project. And hopefully I'll talk to you next time you're in Norway. I, I will be back. So thanks so much, Wolfgang.